Thank you, Mr. Sony, for welcoming us and also for setting the tone of the event. Yes, it looks like a very interesting day filled with a lot of sessions, like he mentioned, and a lot of panel discussions as well. Now, let's delve into the dynamics of the Indian economy. For that, I would like to invite a distinguished speaker, Mr. Neelkant Mishra, Chief Economist, Axis Bank, Head of Global Research, Axis Capital who has joined in May 2023 after a distinguished two-decade career at Credit Suisse. Consistently rated as India's best analyst, he's a part-time member of the Indian PM's Economy Advisory Council and chairman of UIDAI. Mr. Mishra, a gold medalist from IIT Kanpur, has advised government bodies and worked at HUL and Infosys. So let's give him a huge round of applause and welcome him to navigate us through the challenges of global headwinds and the array of domestic opportunities. Over to you, Mr. Mishra, now. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. I have um, a slide deck, which I hope to run through in about uh, uh, 30 minutes. So, but before that, I must uh, thank the Paroda BNP team for inviting me to address such an august audience. Uh, the, the, the starting point for my presentation will be uh, that India seems to be fine, right? And, and uh, if you see, uh, we are about 1.2 years behind where we would have been uh, if COVID had not happened. The way to read the left-hand side chart is that the, uh, the, the, the maroon line is the pre-pandemic trend. So what the economy was growing at, the black line is the actual GDP. And you can see by the end of this year, this, this fiscal year will be about 7% behind where we would have been. Uh, what you see on the right is how many years behind we are versus the pre-pandemic trend. And uh, the world, as you can see, rebounded faster. That was partly because of significant fiscal spending, and I'll spend some time commenting on that. Uh, and we also saw uh, India being a bit slow off the blocks. We were um, almost two years behind where we would have been without the pandemic, but now we are about 1.2 and the world is starting to slip. So as the impact of the fiscal deficit, uh, the fiscal expansion uh, slows down, uh, we, uh, we are seeing the world slip away from the pre-pandemic path. Uh, and I think China is also a big risk. Uh, if you think about India's growth, uh, I, I'm actually the most positive. I've been looking at Indian macros now for more than 15 years. Uh, this is the most positive I feel about the outlook. Uh, if you see the left-hand side chart, uh, the, the split between labor input, capital input, and total factor productivity, you look at the, the last two uh, bits. I hope you can see this green dot here. So this is, this is the labor input. So in between 1980 and 84, 3% of our GDP growth used to come from just the increase in the number of workers. So as our population growth has slowed down, as you can expect, now this number is less than 1%. But I expect this 1% to persist if you are going forward the next five years. It has two parts. It has the number of workers and what they call labor quality, which is and the proxy for that is the number of average number of years of education. So uh, enrollment improvement continues to happen. I mean, the USER data that you must have seen uh, uh, that came out recently. Outcomes are a problem, or at least enrollment is not an issue anymore, right? Most kids are in school. Um, <clears throat> the, the reason why the economy slowed down pre-COVID was because of this. Uh, the capital formation started to slow down. Now, if I was to project it going forward, uh, see, this is India's total factor productivity growth, right? So how well are, you, are we utilizing our uh, labor and capital input and uh, uh, India is among the fastest in the world part of it is because we are so far away from what is called the productivity frontier that uh, uh, we are we are able to grow much faster uh, but it's also because we are we are far ahead of the world in assimilating best practices on the services side so this is this is based on a report which was in 2007 the last data set is for 2004 but it, it still captures, I mean, I haven't seen this breakdown of total factor productivity by sector in any recent study. Perhaps we should do it ourselves, but uh, you will see that in agriculture, TFP growth is rarely above 1%, right? because, you know, you have 
very diff uh, very small farmlands, large number of them. Farmers are generally risk averse. It's very hard to get new technology into farming very quickly. Uh, in industry as well, uh, though I expect this one to start improving now, uh, it's very hard to grow at a very massive scale. In services, uh, India has done remarkably better, right? So you can see total factor productivity growth of you know three to four percent a year, and uh, this is a trend which I think will continue going forward uh, because of several factors, right? So uh, the first is look at this. This is India's share of global services exports, modern services exports. So this is. India's share of glo total global exports, as you can see, it has been growing steadily. And this is modern. What are modern services? Modern services are services which do not require a physical presence. So, so we are very bad in travel. As you know, uh, there are small countries that get more tourists than all of India. Uh, we are very bad in services related to goods transport. So, because our global share of goods trade is only two percent, less than two percent now. Uh, so, we are don't have a very high share in freight services, insurance services, logistic services. But anything that does not require physical presence, we are much, much ahead of where our global share of GDP is. So we are about 3.4% of global GDP. Our uh, global share of modern services trade is 8%. Now, this is not just about dollars coming in. This is also about expertise coming in. So if, for example, there is a global retailer which is now uh, using India for global procurement, uh, it is uh, it is a given that the next time an Indian firm wants to uh, improve, Indian retailer wants to improve its uh, uh, global, I mean its, its procurement, it will have experts in that Bangalore office where it can hire from, right? So, so the, and and uh, while manufacturing and uh, infrastructure take time to build, human brains are much much more uh, alert and they they adapt much faster. So best practices can start coming in very quickly. What is also happening in many services, like if you think about modern trade, which is uh, you know, the modern form of retail, which is much more economically efficient than traditional retail. Um, you know, when you are at 1% market share uh, and you're growing at 20%, you're adding 20 basis points in terms of share. When you are at 4% and growing at 20%, you are, you're adding nearly 1% point. And when you add to that the e-commerce gains, you're now at 8 to 10 percent and now growing at 20, 30 percent. So the various services are actually improving productivity really fast and therefore it is uh, uh, something that we can be quite confident on in terms of productivity. You look at the complete reimagining of infrastructure, look at the pace at which national highways are being built, look at uh, how we used to struggle to spend more on railways. This is percentage of GDP the railway capex uh, and even in fact that was misused i mean a lot of useless capex used to happen in railways now we are starting to see a, a, a very strong reset in the uh, in the ability of railways to do capex and so this is again quite transformative uh, you can see uh, you know uh, fastag is one of the most clear examples of tfp right so you have the same number of uh, trucks you have the same number of truck drivers but you can carry more freight because fast tag exists. So these are things which are uh, very strong drivers of productivity. Uh, you can see how the number of airports is going up. Uh, you can see how uh, uh, micro infrastructure is improving. And this is something that uh, deserves a lot of attention. Uh, when we think of productivity, we somehow, and especially in financial markets that you and I work in, uh, we tend to think only of places which require a lot of capex. But if you, if you read this book by uh, Claudia Golden, uh, you know, Career and Family, uh, till the 1920s, uh, women in the US uh, had only, I mean, had career or family, sorry. Uh, the choice was career or family, right? Because even the US, there was no electrification, there was no uh, sewage systems, there were no uh, central heating, infant mortality was very high. So if the mother decided to go to work and for any reason the child died, she would carry the guilt all her life. Uh, this started to change after 1920. So as electrification spread uh, between 20 years, 1925 to 45, the percentage of houses with washing machines, refrigerators went to nearly 90%. Uh, and then women could actually save time uh, at home. And, uh, and then uh, uh, this, would, this would actually become, uh, and they could actually start spending time at work. And this, these are changes which are now happening in India. 
right? So, uh, so when I read about, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson, uh, if you read his biography, uh, the first time he was one of the youngest uh, uh, you know, congressmen. Uh, in his county, even in the 1930s, there was no electricity. And when he, when he uh, stood and he campaigned, he told the women, you will stop looking like your mother. Uh, uh, there's a very long story behind this that because there was no, no electricity there, the women used to carry water on their backs. By the time they turned 40, their, their, their shoulders would be drooping. And, and he promised they would get them electricity and he got them electricity, right? So this is just 80, 100, 90, 100 years back. And um, these are changes which are happening in India and I think these are very important for total factor productivity. So, so I'm quite confident that TFP will continue to improve. Um, uh, internet, of course, you know, the second, so then why did the economy slow, right? So if, you're, if your labor input is growing at 1% and your total factor productivity is growing at 2% plus, why did the economy start slowing even before COVID? It was because of a shortfall in capital formation. So the pace of capital injection had slowed down. If you see this left hand side chart, uh, oh sorry, this is, this is uh, uh, you know, just government taxes. So if you, this is the chart. This is gross value of output of uh, dwelling construction. Uh, now in an economy where the number of households is growing rapidly, the average size of a house is expanding, the quality of construction is expanding. Uh, why was this happening? Uh, that the, the value of dwelling construction as a percentage of GDP was actually shrinking. Uh, and this was shrinking for a decade. This in our calculation was more than a percent point of GDP drag per year for nearly a decade. Remember that subcontinental sized economies like ours do not do well when the real estate cycle is turning down because uh, uh, this is one of the highest and the heaviest expenses for any household. If you just do a simple math, I do that every year, that uh, how much does your family spend on food and clothing, you multiply that by 30 times and then compare that with the, si with the value of the house you are staying in. And you'll realize that the value of the house, of course, in Mumbai, it's really extreme, but even in most cities, uh, the, the, the house is the biggest purchase that a family makes. And so that's a very important form of capital formation. And it had stopped, it had slowed down significantly. And it had slowed down because of all the factors that we already know. This is when 2012 price to income ratios peaked. Uh, we saw a stagnation in sales volumes. This is where demonetization happened, RERA happened. Uh, then remonetization, here remonetization created policy challenges, we can discuss that if you're interested, but ILNFS goes bust, again another slowdown, slow recovery, COVID. Now, it is after a decade that we are starting to see sales volumes come through. And, and while sales volumes, I think, are a wash in GDP, they don't really impact GDP too much, only the brokerage goes into GDP, it is when houses are built that, that, you, that you see. So you see the, that the GDP gets added. This is the inventory months. In, in several uh, leading developers, inventories are down to two months. So now they need to start building. Uh, you see these ads from big developers that we sold 7,200 crores of apartments in three days. Guess what? Now they have to build it, right? So, and that means there will be demand for steel, cement, labor, and all that. So, so I'm quite confident that on a very important part of capital formation, which is the real estate cycle, we are, we are um, in fact, uh, our, our house recently uh, downgraded real estate stocks. In fact, just before I came in, I was on a call with clients, some 120 of them, uh, uh, talking to them why we have downgraded real estate stocks, but the construction of real estate is likely to continue happening. On the industrial side, if to those of you of that vintage would remember that, you know, in 2007-8, we, I used to be a metals analyst and I used to recall with, uh, with alarm that uh, we had a capacity of 45 million tons and there was 60 million tons under construction. Uh, if you were a thermal power uh, analyst or analyst tracking utilities, you would be shocked to hear that we had 130 gigawatts of power capacity functioning and we were adding 200 gigawatts of new power capacity. Now, when you have something like that, you know, it could end badly, right? So it's, it, and, and those things cannot be repeated. But what has happened over the last eight years is that with almost no thermal power capacity getting added, we are starting to see a rise in PLFs, right? So the plant load factors are rising. October last year was the first month where, in seven years, where we had a peak deficit. 
and I think March will be another month uh, because pre-election month, no state government wants to give uh, a blackout um, and uh, heat waves will be back post Holi anyway. Summer temperatures will rise, and uh, there were there are power producers which are making 1500 crores a month selling spot power. So for those of us, my my vintage would remember that there was this power plant, and you would know the name, uh, which which returned its capex in one and a half years, and that is what led to this gold rush of power plants setting up. So I think some of those things haven't happened for a while, and when they do. The, the capital cycle starts to turn. So companies have deleveraged, uh, and what also happens is that uh, there is, you know, people blame people like us for for acting in herds, a herd mentality, right? But the more I see corporate boards, the more I realize that all of us. I mean, I think following herds is is our, in our genes, and uh, you know, if you read anthropology, you'll realize it's actually quite genetic, and it, this is the reason why we are here. Following herds is very good for us. Uh, but but uh, that aside, I mean, in fact, you know, if you if you if you go south and you have to find out where Church Gate is, you just have to follow the crowd, right? Um, uh, so so the thing is, uh, for boards as well. See, if you're a cement company uh, and you're sitting on 70% utilization, and people are telling you the economy is going to grow at 6% and cement volume is going to grow at 5%. Uh, you'll say, okay, fine, you know, we'll do capex at some point, uh, not right now. You see one year of 12% volume growth and you say, oh God, you know, if this lasts another two years, I'm going to be out of capacity. And then you suddenly uh, scramble, the board meeting happens, you start allocating capex. Your competitor says, oh, that company is doing it, why am I not doing it? And, and then when everyone, every cement company starts doing capex, it actually starts boosting GDP growth up. This is how capital cycles form, and, and we are, I think, at the cusp of something like that. So, um, what is even more remarkable is that all of this is happening despite uh, headwinds. I will, I will narrate four headwinds to you. Uh, in in um, economic uh, terms, uh, you know, there are, there are tools that can be used for uh, controlling the cycle. I mean, Keynesians uh, will tell you that when the demand is low, the government needs to spend. When demand is strong, government needs to cut. And the government of India is indeed cutting. So you can see uh, fiscal consolidation is happening. A reduction in fiscal deficit is a drag on growth. Uh, a boost in fiscal deficit, and I'll have some comments on that about the US, is actually a boost to growth. Um, we need to keep consolidating. As you can see, our debt to GDP is too high. We need to get it here. 60%. So I was part of the FRBM review committee and we had recommended, uh, of course that seems like an ancient time, a 60% debt to GDP target. Um, because we didn't, we, we were here at that time and so we thought we should drift down to here. But because of COVID, the government took a lot of losses, uh, bore a lot of the economic losses and therefore the debt to GDP went up. Uh, but yeah, so to, to get it down, we need to continue to bring down the fiscal deficit. So, yeah, so this, is, this is a process which will continue. And this is, the economy is doing well despite the fiscal deficit coming down. What is also happening is monetary tightening. So as you know, the RBI has raised rates, less said the better. Uh, meaning, you know, we all know this, the weighted average lending rates are st still starting to go, still going up. It takes a while for the rollovers to happen. But what is most shocking is this. See, uh, the RBI, you can see for a long time, uh, see, this is, the, this is the repo rate. This was the effective rate. So you can see that the, the reverse repo uh, uh, at one point was setting the marginal rate, right? Uh, and it was much lower than the repo rate. Then for a while, we kind of trundled along here. And now RBI has tightened liquidity so much that it has pushed up to the MSF, right? The marginal standing facility. Now, why has it happened? This is, this is the effective money injection by the RBI over a 12-month period. So you can see it used to, uh, from 14 onwards, uh, add about 3 to 5 trillion rupees over a 12 month period. In the last 18 months, it has added all of zero. Last 12 months, it's negative. So uh, when, when the RBI tightens like this, uh, it, it slows down credit growth. And now it is starting to slow down credit growth. Banks now, I think, will be forced to ration credit. Uh, they will be, because you know, if the demand is for, say, 100 rupees, uh, and your supply is only 80, the only way to allocate that is to 
raise prices, right? So then the, the folks who uh, can only survive with low interest rates will not demand that credit. And so I think effective rates will keep going up. And so this, whatever economic strength you are seeing is despite this extreme level of what I call quantitative tightening. See, um, in an economy that is growing at 10-11% a year, to have zero monetary expansion for 18 months is India's version of quantitative tightening. So I've been talking about this for 6-7 months. I think finally it is now showing up in banks struggling to raise deposits. And this is actually because of what RBI is intentionally. I mean, this is intentional. This is not accidental. Um, and the third big headwind is uh, slowing exports of goods and services. So, so goods exports have slowed, services exports have slowed, and remember the Indian economy is still doing well. Right? So this has all uh, been happening for a while. And the fourth is, and this I want to spend some time on this, uh, is the rising global cost of capital. Uh, what you see here is the Congressional Budget Office's projection for U.S. fiscal deficit. So this is the primary deficit. This is the interest cost. This is the fiscal deficit. This, as you know, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, gives a 10-year forecast for the, uh, the U.S. federal fiscal balance. Uh, and this is till 2033. Now, this is the CBO's projection of what the debt to GDP is going to be. Right? So it is at 100%. This is debt held by the public. This does not include the debt held by the Fed. The Federal Reserve is also a debt holder. Uh, the Federal Reserve's, you know, interest cost then goes back to the government, right? That's just like in India, the, the, the dividend that RBI gives to the government uh, is the same as the Fed also pays a dividend to the U.S. Treasury. So you only need to worry about the debt held by the public. Now, this is at 100, it's supposed to go to about 125. Now, the problem is that the CBO got, and this is, this is there on the website, uh, the CBO says that they got their fiscal deficit last year wrong by 3.9 percent points. Imagine if the Indian fiscal deficit was not 5.9 percent of GDP as, as has been budgeted by the government, but 9.8 percent. And, and imagine the mayhem that would happen. Uh, and, and what this does is uh, that you see this is not here, but here, right? And if you extrapolate that over 10 years, this number goes to 150-160%. And this is, remember, a pro-cyclical fiscal deficit in the sense that you are having 8.5% uh, fiscal deficit when your, uh, when your unemployment is at 3.5%. So if your unemployment goes to 5% or 5.5%, this number will go to 10%. And what is even more worrying, if you are looking at debt to GDP ratios, for those of you who have done the modeling, in the year where you have a recession, your denominator stops growing, which means that in one year, your debt to GDP ratio can jump up by 10 percent points. And, and those are things that are, I think, still ahead of us. So this is what has happened to the fiscal deficit. This is adjusted for student loans. We are, you know, even this year, even in this fiscal year, FY24, as you know, their fiscal year runs from October to September. Even in this fiscal year, till, so the October, November, December, their fiscal deficit is up 20 percent year on year. So, so it was nearly 7.5 percent last year. I mean, there are some one-offs, so we adjust for that. This year, we are running at a run rate of 8.5 percent of GDP. So when we, you hear about soft landing, be very careful, because uh, this is being supported by what is absolutely unsustainable level of uh, fiscal expansion. And this is the reason why it has happened. See, this is uh, uh, revenues as a percentage of GDP. So the the, they had expected that it would slow, come down slowly, it has come down very sharply. And this is the reason why uh, you, are, you are seeing a, a very strong fiscal pressure in the US. And this is something which the markets are not yet worried about. And why is that? You see, uh, see if the, if the, you would expect that if the U.S. fiscal deficit was up by a trillion dollars in one year, right, adjusted for the student loans, which in FY22 uh, was one trillion, became two trillion dollars in FY23, uh, and then I said it's now running at a pace of 2.4 trillion dollars annualized. Uh, why is it not showing up in the bond market? In the Indian bond market, you miss by 10 basis points, the yields go up by 30 basis points, right? Uh, uh, why is it not showing up? And this is what has happened. So. Uh, 
the the maroon is the stock so you can see foreigners own about 29% uh, fed owns give or take about 17 18% banks own about 6 7% now of the last 12 months the foreigners are about 23 i mean there is we can argue this uh, the fed of course is doing qt banks are running scared 90% has come from households and funds and a large part of this is money market mutual funds. So what has happened last year is that uh, uh, the Fed or rather the Treasury shockingly 80% of its uh, fund funding has come from T-bills. Imagine the, the, so this is the stock, this grey line is the stock of notes. As you know there are T-bills, there are notes and there are bonds, right? So less than one year is bills. 2 to 10 year is notes, 20 and 30 years, 15, 20, 30 years is bonds. Now, as a stock, notes and bonds are about 75 to 80 percent, 70, 75 percent of the total. In flow, in the last 12 months, they are less than 20 percent. The largest issuer of debt in the world is funding itself on less than one year paper. And it is at as deep a cyclical low as you can imagine, right? So, if, if you, if you draw, do pull this forward also, you will still get the number which is higher than this. So, this is absolutely unsustainable. Now, uh, and, and when you see, hear all this bullishness about, uh, oh, you know, the yields have fallen, guess what? Beginning of last year, the yields were more or less where they are. Right? So, uh, it is just because they had gone to 5 percent at 3.8 at that point and now it has gone up to actually 4.05, 4.06 last night I think or 0 09. Uh, and uh, so, I think the, the, the global funding situation is actually quite scary, especially if you think about the quantitative tightening. So, you can see that uh, money supply in the world, dollar supply is shrinking. So, QT means that your, the, the Fed is of course reducing the number of dollars. Uh, as credit growth slows down, because banks, you know, when they give get loans, they give, uh, they, they create dollars. Credit growth is slowing down. That's the intentional outcome of uh, higher interest rates. So, so M2 is negative in an economy which is growing at seven, eight percent in nominal terms. So, M2 minus NGDP is the worst we have seen since 1959 which means that dollar availability outside of the US is the worst in many, many years, many decades. Now, in the last two months, because the treasury yields have fallen and there is a, this expectation of a soft landing, uh, the, so we are now starting to see some brave folks like, you know, Ivory Coast is issuing the first dollar bonds in two years. I mean, so Africa had seen zero dollar access in the last two years. I think the first bond issuance is, is underway. Let's see how it goes. Brazil is now starting to issue some paper. The last month or so, we've seen Saudi Arabia and a few others, Malaysia, I think, uh, issue some paper. But dollar availability outside the US, it's almost like, you know, like the first feeder, right? So if you have 10 rotis, the guy who's eating first does not care whether it is nine or 11 which is the US federal government. Uh, if, it is, if, if it is the last feeder, which is uh, Pakistan or Sri Lanka or, or, or you know, an African country, that is the one that faces most of the pain. So my sense is, if you, if you uh, go back to that debt to GDP chart, right, any country which is at this level and most likely at this level, as I explained, this is the CBO's projection, but the actual projection will be somewhere here. Um, and you are still thinking about a primary deficit, right? So if you are, suppose that 150% of GDP, right? You take 4% cost, 6% is your interest cost. Your primary deficit is three, so you're talking about a 9% fiscal deficit. Your, de your, your uh, denominator cannot grow at 9%, right? Because it's the US economy. So they are so close to the productivity frontier, your real growth cannot be more than two, and you actually want the inflation to be two, so you'll be growing at four. Your, your debt to GDP is on an absolutely unsustainable path. And if Trump wins, uh, there is going to be another four trillion dollars over ten years added to the deficit, right? Because he wants to. I mean, we can discuss that in Q and A. I don't want to take too much time. But but the point is, the Fed has to start buying. So so coming back to this chart, this cannot sustain. They have to come in and start buying again. So they have to start tapering QT and start doing QE again. 
right? And and there has to be financial repression. Uh, U.S. banks will be forced to buy bonds because there are no other solutions, right? Who's going to buy? You look at this list. Foreigners are not going to buy a lot more. So who's going to buy all the increased issuance that is coming? There's limited appetite. I mean, this will only grow at a certain pace. So banks and the Fed only have to buy. So we just have to wait for them to start buying before we start saying that, okay, fine. So now we know what the outcome is because uh, the, this is an absolutely unsustainable situation. So anyway, so this is where we are. Uh, uh, what, what therefore happens is that I think the global cost of capital will remain elevated. Uh, uh, you can see the treasury yield, uh, the, the, the nifty earnings yield minus treasury yield is at ridiculous levels. So this has to go up either P multiples fall or treasury yields fall. I don't think treasury yields will fall, so P multiples have to fall. It will not happen in one year, it will happen over four or five years. But if you remember this phase, right, around this time, uh, people of my ilk, and I see Nandu is here, uh, if, you, if you push someone at HUL at, at uh, you know, 40 times earnings in 2011, they would have thrown you out of the room. Uh, so expensive stock, right? Uh, uh, very soon as the world got used to low interest rates, that 40 became 45, then 50, then 55. And today, these days, you have young analysts coming up and saying, you know, this stock was 80 times, now it's 70 times, I want to upgrade it, it's become very cheap. So, uh, so uh, but these things happen, right? This is how we, our expectations get reset. But, but what was 13, 14 times will most likely be 16, 17. See, India is a much better economy than it was 10 years back. So, uh, I think we'll deserve a higher multiple. Our currency risk is much lower. Our, our I think, economic volatility is much lower. Uh, but, but I don't think 18 to 20 is the right range given what's happening to global cost of capital. So this is something that we have to get used to. It will not happen in one, sh one shot because the market is anchored to very different behavior, but this will happen. Uh, what is supportive for India is, this is Nifty EPS for 24, 25, 26. The remarkable thing about these lines is that they're not sloping downward. Right? Uh, uh, that uh, for those of us, I mean, we have been tracking this. They're always downward sloping worms, right? So you, you start at 100, you end at 70 or 80 or uh, 85. Uh, and and so, so this is what used to happen. So you can see that, uh, you know, FY26 has started about, you know, four or five months back. Uh, so it lasts for about two and a half years. You start in October 26, uh, so October 23, and then you end in F March 26, two and a half years. Over these two and a half years, the Nifty EPS would fall by maybe 12% to 30%. So every quarter, you were used to... Okay, someone is really snoring now. Uh, <laughs> I could hear that snoring sound. So, uh, uh, so, so this is uh, something that um, uh, has changed. So see, post-COVID, you are, you are seeing um, this... Uh, uh, you are seeing that the earnings are no longer getting cut and which is very supportive of, um, uh, of the market. So, so, you know, most likely we will not see a very sharp drawdown on the Nifty. If there are some global accidents, maybe, you know, uh, that, that's a low probability. I mean, generally is a low probability element. You cannot play for accidents. But I think a reduction in P and uh, a sustained roll forward gains is what I think is the outcome going forward. So, so you can see this, that Nifty is now close to one standard deviation above its 10-year average. Uh, one year later, it will be at its 10-year average. When I, you know, two, a, a month and a half back, this was 0.5 and this was minus 0.5. So, so we have already gone up a lot and I, I really worry about uh, where the Nifty is in the near term. But I do think that we will time correct for a while. So with this, and this, is, this, is, this effectively sets the stage for which other sectors we prefer. So I'm told there's seven, eight minutes to go. I'll stop here and perhaps we can take questions. Thank you, Mr. Mishra. And yes, uh, we do have certain questions. We'll be doing a Q&A session, but I have received some questions. I would like to start with that. And meanwhile, uh, you can prepare or you can, you know, uh, keep your questions ready. So the first question that I have is, that is, what do you see as the potential risk to the growth scenario as outlined by you? And what could derail or show India's economic growth in the near to medium term? is uh, 
pretty, pretty obvious and this is a common answer I give, I'm sure anyone who looks at Indian macro will, will appreciate that, is uh, that we need, that we are a big importer of energy. Uh, a dollar per barrel of oil is 1.6 billion dollars a year because we import 1.6 billion barrels every year. So if you see a 20 dollar increase in oil price, uh, you have a 32 billion dollar, 1 percent of GDP impact. Some of it can be offset by fiscal support, but um, this is a very big drag on, on the economy. Uh, I think uh, fiscal indiscipline can be a big risk as well, that's more in the medium term. So uh, if, you're, if your debt to GDP is very elevated and you are not spending, because see, if you bring down uh, your fiscal deficit too fast, the debt to GDP again becomes unsustainable in the sense that if you bring it down by say 2% points in one year, your GDP growth starts to slow and so the denominator stops growing and so you can very quickly get caught in a fiscal trap. So this is one of those times where you have to very slowly, gradually bring it down and, and as you spend, you have to be very prudent about the quality of fiscal spending. So if you, if you say, you know, use it to build roads or infrastructure, uh, in the first year it supports because that itself is activity and in the future years it supports economic activity. Whereas if you, if you say distribute it for free power or free bus rides or you know just general grants, uh, it, it get burns out very quickly and therefore the debt to GDP reduction then uh, slows down. And those are very important for macroeconomic stability. Uh, and, and I think uh, perhaps uh, uh, the third is the, the global, because see we are in, 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 the, in the next three years I think we will become current account surplus. I hope we don't because I think the economy needs to grow a lot more, so, uh, but if we become, uh, it, it, but till the, till the next three years, I think we are still dependent on external uh, funding. Uh, till 2019, we could, we could uh, fund a 70, 80 billion dollar current account deficit. I think today we will struggle to fund uh, even a 45 billion dollar current account deficit because of the slowdown in internal, uh, the external capital inflows. and. Um, uh, if, the, if the global environment muddies further, which is what I think is likely to happen, uh, we don't know when, it happens in one and a half years or six months or nine months, but uh, it will happen and that also I think will also uh, slow us down. All right. And I have another one, obviously I have two more questions with me. I hope you all are keeping your questions ready. Well, the second one would be, while India's GDP continues to grow and we are on the target to be the third largest economy, how can we achieve a faster per capita income growth? Um, yeah, that's a very, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a hard question. <laughs> it's not uh, uh, easy to solve, but there are many, many ways. See, a country which is 17% of global population, there cannot be one aspect which drives GDP growth. So if you are a Singapore or a, even a Korea, uh, you know, domination in three or four sectors will, will, is enough to get you to rich income status, rich country status. But if you are India, then you need to get a lot of things right. Uh, uh, the first thing I would say is we need to attract more FDI. Uh, because FDI, if you remember the first part of the discussion about total factor productivity, the pace at which technology is diffusing, the pace at which we can get connected to global value chains and get a lot of precious dollars. Uh, so we need to speed up. Uh, so we are still losing ground to say a Vietnam or a Cambodia in terms of the people exiting China because everyone has to read uh, Xi Jinping thought these days uh, if you are in corporate, uh, in any company in, the, in China. They are trying to exit but we are not welcoming enough I think, there are not too much of them, too many of them coming to India and we, we, we need to accelerate that. I think I can see there is good traction but we need to work on that. The second is we need to uh, really go really granular in terms of our administration. See, thankfully, over the last 10 years, uh, we have seen the narrative shift from just Delhi to actually state governments. So you're seeing state governments becoming proactive. Um, a lot of these, and some of them are just uh, random announcements, but at least there is an attempt to attract investment because the, because the, the factors of production, land, labor, are all controlled by state governments. But Indian states are also too large and I think we need to devolve that power to district level. We need to start administering, giving independence to districts in terms of fiscal levers, in terms of uh, administrative ease. Uh, and when they start happening, we'll be managing our cities much better. 
uh, we also need to uh, you know change our direct taxes i think our, our tax to gdp is too low some people think that adjusted for our per capita gdp it is not that bad but i do think that our tax capacity uh, is 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 higher than what is portrayed to be and therefore uh, we should be you know changing our tax collection so there are many many things that i think we can do uh, but yeah but uh, the question the underlying i would say the sentiment in that question that we cannot be satisfied with 7% growth is something i totally agree with but talking about the same thing if you can add more to it that what can help india to grow the per capita income faster yeah so all of those measures uh, uh, and and in addition i think you know we have to start preparing for what many countries have struggled with which is uh, you know in 15 years time maybe 18 years time we'll start hitting the the threshold at which many countries have struggled which is the classic middle income trap so what happens when you are a, 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 a you know a economy which is far away from the productivity frontier you you are your a lot of your growth is through diffusion of technology right so you are like for say in telecom so you struggle with fixed line telephony but then you wait for someone to do the innovation uh, produce cheap handsets produce cheap telecom equipment and then you start offering the cheapest uh, whatever data in the world and you start to grow but as you start to get to 10 12000 dollars per capita gdp uh, you will you you will have to start innovating and that's a very different style it requires a very different uh, regulatory environment that's a very different risk appetite for businesses and many countries have struggled when they've reached that stage a lot of latin america uh, i would say even china is now struggling with that so uh, uh, so if you have to grow rich before we grow old we need to start preparing for some of those transitions um, and and i think that therefore it's even more important to have a sense of urgency that we are not satisfied with 5% or 7% growth or say 6% per capita growth but 7 8% per capita growth and and um, do that without maxing out so you can get that growth for one or two years by doing fiscal expansion or being very easy on the monetary policy but that's not sustainable to the government's credit and the rbi's credit the policy focus right now is stability so the stability uh, of interest rates stability of exchange rates stability of growth uh, stability of inflation at least that's the objective and so you give that predictive power to a predictable trajectory to the corporate sector the private corporates and the hope is that they will start investing more and and i do expect that that will happen so you have to maintain that and then aspire for uh, you know uh, becoming a product nation owning brands owning owning technology uh, many many fronts i mean it's very hard to enumerate them all right thank you so much so any questions from the audience now we'll just pass on the mic to you Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for the lovely presentation. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my question is, uh, some of the data points I was looking at, uh, be it the CDS spread between India and US, or you know the FPI holding in Indian equities, I mean, both being at decadal low kind of levels. And even the valuation, if you look at, uh, you know, while the price to earning may look you know, expensive, but when I look at price to earning to growth side on that parameter, we don't look that expensive compared to US or any other you know, developed nation. <clears throat> so my question, given this back, and, and the Indian economy, as you also spoke about. So given this background, uh, going forward, you expect a price correction or the time correction in the market, equities per se, question number one. And uh, one should play equity like equal weight, underweight, what would you suggest, uh, you know, short to medium term? Uh, okay, so uh, short term, though, you know, uh, we just have to follow where the crowd is. Uh, medium term, uh, to answer the second part of your question, I think bonds are better than equities in my view because, you know, whatever measure of ERP you take, equity risk premium, uh, the ERP on in Indian equity is actually negative, uh, which is absolutely scary, right? So that that your uh, uh, a negative, I mean, actually too low, uh, and uh, which suggests that. Uh, government bonds are actually uh, uh, more attractive than than Indian equity. I mean, on that simple formula. 
Uh, in the near term, of course, it can go the other way. But uh, if you're thinking three to five years, I still think that that should be. Only advantage is taxation there, but uh, on, on the equity side. Otherwise, uh, I think assets like, uh, wise, the bonds are more attractive. The point on Indian equities being more attractive. See, remember that flows don't happen in a vacuum. So it's, it's, it's not an unconstrained channel. So when you are thinking about foreign portfolio investors and their flows, they are also dependent on the plumbing. So, so out of the uh, whatever 18% of BSE 500 that foreigners own, say give or take $700 billion, I think it's slightly more than that now, uh, about a third of that comes from sovereign wealth funds, pension <coughs> funds, you know, so, uh, the endowments. These have very long-term horizons and they generally allocate as a percentage of GDP. So if India's share of GDP is growing, we'll keep getting more of that. The remaining two-thirds, 80-85%, so this is all the pension, the, the mutual funds, the hedge funds and all of that. Nearly two-thirds of that, actually no, 80-85% of that, of those two-thirds, is EM funds, so India allocation to EM funds, uh, uh, from, from EM funds, Asia funds, global funds, BRICS funds and all that. Only about 15% is from India funds. Meaning that beyond a point, see India's share is now 17% out of EM, right? Now, your most funds will be in the 15 to 19% bracket. Because very few will have the risk appetite to go to 25 or 5. And uh, so, in, a, in many ways, the FPI flows to India are linked to what is the appetite for emerging market uh, equities. And that we are, it's often I hear this confused debate where it is China versus India. It's not that. I think it is China and India in the sense that in Asia funds, in BRICS funds, in uh, EM funds, China and India are bracketed together. So if China gets more flows or through the EM funds, India will also get more flows. So that is why you will have noticed that as the bond yields fell in the US from 5% to 3.8 and now they bounced back. Uh, uh, so when the fall was happening, a lot of money was coming into EM funds and India also saw the foreigners coming back. And in the last two weeks, uh, as the EM funds have seen outflows, India is also seeing outflows. So when you think about foreign portfolio investors and whether they have the challenge, the, the, the ability to, to act on India's bullishness, the, India is not yet an asset class. See, at about three and a half, four percent of global uh, equity markets, we are we are not yet an asset class. So, uh, so we have to be aware of how the plumbing works. Like it's the same in in Indian assets, right? Uh, equities are seeing such strong demand from retail investors through SIPs and through EPFO and through insurance and a lot of other channels, but there is no demand for bonds. And so this is now what has happened. So what, what we are seeing now is supply is starting to respond. So uh, because equities have become so cheap or so expensive and so equity cost of capital has become so cheap that every promoter, every PE investor is wanting to offload. So we are seeing, uh, you know, IPOs being brought forward. What was supposed to happen in July is happening now. And, and so these are all signs that I think, uh, you know, the, the, the plumbing which is great. I mean, I think, you know, risk capital being formed any which way, I mean, we shouldn't be judgmental. But, but similarly for global flows, right? So if the plumbing is not there, the flows won't happen. One second, we'll just pass on the mic to you. So since you're expecting that, you know, in three to five years, you know, the bonds are going to be better than equity in terms of returns. Where do you find the interest rates in India to move, uh, uh, I mean, to, uh, to what extent do you think you can fall, it? you, you okay. see it falling in the next three to five years, sir? Yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, uh, part of my uh, judgment there is also dependent on the government sticking to its fiscal consolidation path. So, if the government does deliver on the, the central government does deliver on the four and a half percent deficit by FY26, for nearly five, six years, uh, your five years, your gross issuance or net issuance of bonds would have been unchanged. And I think that will bring down bond yields. So uh, if you ask me, that is the only uncertainty I have about the impact of elections on the economy. Because if this government comes back, then I think they will stick to the fiscal consolidation path. And that will mean that 10-year um, uh, bond yields will, will come off. 
Uh, no, I <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I don't. I don't publish yield forecast. But I can uh, actually we we have published a forecast. Uh, we're talking about 6.8, but that's not a five-year forecast. I mean, it's more like in the next maybe one and a half years. Hello, uh, I have one question, sir. Uh, post 2016 of demonetization and last three years all-time high UPI and digital transactions are happening. Why the cash in the system is at all-time high? Like as per the RBI data, like currently 3.9 trillion rupees or something is the, in the cash. Before, like at demonetization, it, it was 1.6 or 16 trillion. So, any view on that, sir? Because banks are not getting deposits or CASA is at the very no no uh, banks zero. are not getting deposits that's what i was explaining it is because rbi is not injecting but the money. cash where is the ca like this much high cash after the all the digital mm, transaction uh, you know the the right way to look at cash is as a percentage of gdp oh and the trajectory that we are seeing right so what happened uh, so it, it is human behavior so you have to think about 1.4 billion humans and how they would respond to the fact that uh, for, for three, six months, they did not have enough cash. So the first response is to hoard as much cash as they can. And so cash to GDP first then goes up because once the remonetization happened, that is what happened. Then you start, start, started seeing that decline. So if you plot that cash to GDP ratio, it was starting to see a decline and then you hit COVID. And then in COVID again, uh, because access to bank branches was difficult, people had to be locked in, they started to store a lot of cash. Uh, now with the 2,000 rupees being brought back and 97% of that coming back into the banking system, actually the currency, the growth in currency in circulation year on year is far lower than nominal GDP. So that trajectory is very much on. I don't think, uh, uh, you know, we are going back to use of high cash. But remember that uh, currency is, is, is very innate to human society and, and there is a certain basic amount that people will need. To the point that we get to 4%, like what is there in some of the Scandinavian countries, will take 30, 40 years. About maybe more than 10 years, 30, 40, I don't know. All right. Thank you. I think with this, we'll end the Q&A for now. But I, I would like to take one last question with the sir who raised his hand first. So one quick question, because we have the other things as well to go ahead with. Yeah. Uh, we'll just pass on the mic. Yeah. Yeah, so both are, um, I, I wish you had asked those questions first. I would love to take some time to answer them, but uh, given that we are short of time, let me answer them crisply. I, in th I definitely think that we need to dramatically increase female labor force participation, right? Give, if you have a 30-year window, so remember that our median age will cross 40 by 2053 as per the current projections. And if you have to get rich, you have to get as many women into the workforce as we can. Uh, in that period because you know it is their productive age so uh, what is required for that is a whole you know range of things so if you see uh, in the new deal of FDR in the 1930s uh, the system of crashes was started it was done just to create jobs but it freed up a lot of women to enter the workforce uh, we need to be at a at every company level start to think about what is what are the policies for maternity because what happens in say consulting firms, legal firms, most of the firms is that uh, the critical period where you know you are on the path to becoming a partner or becoming a senior member of the team, you you are kind of uh, you know distracted by the act of bringing up kids, and there is a narrow window in which you need to have kids. I think there are many deep uh, concerns and questions which you need to address. Um, in addition to, of course, you know safety. For example, uh, uh, HUL, when it started its Sumerpur factory, or actually expanded its Sumerpur factory, um, it wanted to employ a lot of women. Uh, but in UP, beyond 7 p.m., women were not allowed to work. So you'd be surprised, the UP government changed its laws. And now there is a three-shift operation uh, handled by women in the Sumerpur factory. This reminds me of what used to happen 
in, uh, uh, in, in the US, uh, you know, till the 1940s. In fact, the law was changed in 52, where if you got married uh, as a teacher in a school, you could be fired. And that was the law. And so, so it takes time, but I think we are on the right path, and, and you are absolutely right that I think we need to uh, move forward on that. Uh, on the low income consumption, remember that there are many layers to that. The first is, if you take the, the expenditure side of GDP, uh, so, uh, you know, PFC, private final consumption, and, and GFCF, gross fixed capital formation, are effectively mirror images. So, if your investment to GDP ratio is going up, your PFC has to, share will come down, right? So, it will grow slower then. So, if your GDP growth is 7, your private final consumption will grow at 4.5 uh, or maybe 5 percent. Within that, remember that we are still 1.2 years behind where we would have been in terms of output terms. But the labor force has kept growing. So, we have at least one and a half crore extra workers uh, who have joined and who don't have work. So, labor doesn't have pricing power. Now, at the bottom end of the pyramid, I would say even the bottom 60, 70 percent, uh, real income growth is not happening. Uh, so, in fact, it's not happening at the upper end also, but the upper end has enough buffers because they, you know, top 20 percent of India's households save more than 40 percent of their income. So, if inflation goes up, their in consumption doesn't get suffered. I mean, it doesn't suffer, it's their savings that suffer. But uh, for the bottom 50, 60 percent, uh, if there's a higher inflation, you're toast. So, I do expect that FMCG volume numbers will pick up now that price growth is slowing down. But in aggregate, the value growth for low income consumption will lag that of the overall GDP. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mishra. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.